Well, hi, everyone. And greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. I've got a very interesting question for you today, and we're going to work through the answer together. And I'm going to warn you, there's some scary math ahead. What happens if we take the Earth and we drill a tunnel completely through the Earth, through the center of the Earth, and out the other side? Now, granted, we can't do this. You know, you Star Wars fans know what happened to Alderaan. But let's say for the moment we can. Now, if I were to drop a mass or a ball in one end of that tube, how long would it take it to get to the other side? Let's go ahead and figure it out. Now, before we do anything, let's go ahead and state the problem very clearly. Okay, so every good math problem starts with a drawing. So here we have the Earth. The dot here is the center of the Earth. Uh, the circumference out here is at the radius from the center. And here's our tunnel going straight through the Earth. So we're going to drill a hole through the center of the earth. We're going to drop a ball, and we want to find out how long it'll take, if I drop the ball here, for it to come out down here. Now, there's an old saying in physics that you can calculate when the cows will come home, so long as they're spherical cows on a frictionless surface in a vacuum. So like our spherical cows, we have a few conditions for this particular exercise. First of all, the tunnel has to be frictionless. Uh, there can't be any friction from the sides of the tunnel. There can be no air resistance, so essentially it's going to have to be in a vacuum. And the other thing is we're going to treat the Earth as being of a uniform density. And from Cavendish, we know that that particular density is about 5,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And as you know, the force of gravity equals the gravitational constant times mass 1, mass 2, divided by the square of the radius separating them. Now, for our purposes, and I'll show you why here in just a second, we're going to just substitute x squared for r squared. Now, as an object falls through the Earth, it starts off with an x value of the radius of the Earth. And then as it starts falling down through the Earth, that radius gets smaller and smaller down to the center of the Earth. Now, a good way of looking at this is that you take a second sphere, of radius wherever the ball is. Now you can discard the shell outside of this smaller sphere because all the net forces of gravity zero out. And the only thing you really have to worry about anymore is the gravitational attraction of the smaller sphere. That's why I went ahead and used x instead of r because x will change as it goes down towards the center of the Earth and out the other side. Now this is a good time to talk about these masses as well. Mass 1 is the mass of the ball. Mass 2 is the mass of the sphere or the Earth of radius x. How do we figure out the mass of the Earth? Well, actually that's not that bad. So let's take this part of the equation, g m1 over x squared times this second larger mass. Well, what's that going to be? That's going to be 4 over 3 pi times the radius, which is going to be x of the ball. I almost wrote r there for a second. And that's going to be cubed. And then we're going to multiply that by the density of Earth. Now this makes sense because, as you know, density is mass divided by volume. The volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So if we multiply the volume by the density, we get the total mass. So here's our new equation. Uh, we take basically this part of the gravitational equation, and that's right here. Now, the mass of the Earth is this value right here, and that's 4 thirds pi times x cubed times the density of Earth. Now, notice that your x2 cancels with two of these x's, and you end up with this equation right here. So we just have the 1x up here now. Now I want to do something that's known as physics algebra. Uh, the difference between physics algebra and regular algebra is that you use brackets to preserve the structure of the equation. Now, that'll become more important in other videos, but I just kind of want to use this consistently throughout all my videos. So let's go ahead and see what I mean by physics algebra. So right here we have the equation that we just came up with. All right, and you've noticed that I put some brackets around it. Now, there's a number of terms in here that are kind of important uh, and interesting. For example, g the gravitational constant is a constant. The mass of the ball is not changing at all. 4 and 3 and even pi are all constants. And so is the density of Earth. So we're going to rearrange this so that we take all of the constants and take them out of the brackets 
and then just leave in the brackets the variables. Well, now we have something kind of interesting because we have all the constants over here and we have just the variable left here. Now, one other thing that we have to add is recall that when we're going towards the center of the Earth, all right, this is the positive direction, that is the negative direction, so we need to put a negative sign out in front of this. Now, the next thing that I want to do is since this is all a constant and is not going to change, why don't we just call it a constant? Let's go with K. And now all we have left is that. Now, for some of you, that may look familiar. This is Hooke's Law. Now, this gives us our first real clue as to how we're going to solve this. Hooke's Law determines how a spring goes up and down. Now, another example of a simple oscillator is a pendulum, just like we've been talking about the Foucault pendulums the last few videos. That's why I did it, because I wanted to get ready to talk about this. Now, you may notice I didn't mention anything about the mass in the last equation. That's because I was working on the oscillating part. Let's go ahead and bring the mass back in. Now, the period of a simple oscillator is given by this equation. So the period of this oscillation is given by 2 pi times the square root of the mass over that constant k. And the frequency is given by the square root of gravity divided by the length of the radius. Now the period is also given by 1 over the frequency or 1 over w. So if you look at it that way, the period equals 2 pi over w. That equals 2 pi times the inverse of this, which is L over G, and that's the square root. You may recall that that's the formula of a pendulum, because a pendulum is a harmonic oscillator. But let's get back to business here, because we're almost done. Now, as you may recall, K equals 4 pi times the gravitational constant, the mass of the ball, times the density of Earth, over 3. Now, if we substitute that back into this equation right here, so we put in k right here, we end up with this. Notice that the 4 and the 3 flip because we're, we're doing the inverted form of it. Now, we've got a couple of other things that can cancel in here, too. First of all, the masses cancel. Now, we have to remember that a full oscillation is the trip down and the trip up. We're only interested in the trip down, so we can get rid of that, too, and just make it a 1. Now, the other problem that we have is this pi. So we've got a square root of a pi down here, and we've got a pi out here. That's a little cumbersome. Now, if, if pi is the square root of something, what's the something? Well, let's go ahead and redo it. It's pi squared. Now we're left with this. One of those pi's cancel, so we get rid of that term. So t equals 3 pi over 4 g p. And then we take the square root of that whole mess. Now, the interesting thing about this is all of these are constants. 3 is a constant, pi is a constant, 4 is a constant, the gravitational constant, and the density of Earth. We can solve for this. So when we put in the values of g and p, we get the square root of 3 pi divided by 4. This is the value of g right here, and this is the density, or p, of Earth. Then when you take the square root of that whole mess, what do you end up with? This comes out in seconds, and that is the time it takes to go through the center of the Earth. Start here, end up down here. 42 minutes, 10 and a half seconds. Now there's a second very interesting question. What if the tunnel doesn't go through the center of the Earth? What if it's more of a chord length out here offset from the center? How long would that take? Now, if you think about this and think back to our videos on the pendulum, the period of the pendulum doesn't depend on the arc of the swing. And as a result of that, it should make some sense to you when I tell you that if we take that chord length tunnel, it will also take the exact same amount of time, 42 minutes, 10 and a half seconds. And actually, that does kind of make some sense. Are you ready for something a little more surprising? I'm going to show you something really cool. What is the orbital equation? Well, in an orbit, you have the gravitational attraction of a satellite to the Earth, and you have the centrifugal force 
acting in the opposite direction of the gravitational attraction. And when these two are in balance, the satellite up here is in a stable orbit over the Earth. More importantly, this mass, the mass of the satellite, is on both sides. So we can divide that out and do some cancellation and a little rearrangement, and we end up with the square of the orbital velocity equals the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth over the radius of the, of the satellite. If the radius of the satellite and the radius of the Earth are the same, in other words, the satellite's just skimming across the ground. I know that sounds stupid, but just roll with me for a minute. What would the speed and the period of the orbit be? Well, that's actually pretty easy to figure out. But first, let's ask ourselves one last question about our tunnel through the Earth. You realize that when the ball is right here and we're getting ready to drop it, its velocity is zero. It then speeds up all the way down to the center of the Earth. And then once it passes the center of the Earth, it slows down at the same rate. And as a result, its velocity is zero when it comes out the other side as well. The maximum velocity is right here. And that is 7,900 in 9.5 meters per second. We get that from calculating it with calculus. I'm not going to do that with this. But that's the maximum speed. If you calculate this velocity out, what's it going to equal? It's actually going to equal 7,909.5 meters per second. And if you divide that speed, which coincidentally happens to be the speed at the center of the Earth, when we drop that ball through, and divide it by the circumference of the Earth, what do we get? We get 84 minutes, 21 seconds, which coincidentally happens to be the exact same time it would take to drop the ball down through the center of the Earth and have it return back to its starting position. Now tell me that's not cool. But wait, there's more. Let's take one more consideration. Say you've got a friend. When you jump in the hole going through the center of the Earth, you put a baseball glove on, and your friend launches a baseball over the surface of the Earth at 7,909.5 meters per second. What's going to happen? So basically, as you start falling through the Earth, the ball is going to start orbiting the Earth at the surface. So when you come out the other side at 42 minutes, 10 and a half seconds, you can turn to the side and catch the baseball. And that, my friends, is why science is awesome. This is Bob the Science Guy. Thank you very much for stopping by. I hope Everybody enjoyed this. I know it was a lot of math, but I think I made it pretty easy to understand. And I hope you all followed along with it. It's an interesting thing. So hit that like and subscribe, and I'll see you again soon.